Hello and welcome to another slice of Daily Bread. I'm so glad that you have joined us today. Today's devotional will be brought to us by Terry Buechler. Terry, welcome to Daily Bread. Thank you. Now, as we always do, let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your loving watch care over each one of us. We also thank you for your precious word that you have given to us. And as we study a little bit here today, I pray for your blessing to be upon us in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. A few years ago, I had a Jewish neighbor that was a, uh, a dealer in diamonds and he went to all the different uh, uh, jewelry stores wholesale, selling wholesale diamonds. And he knew that I was a Christian and I was interested in uh, some of his Jewish traditions. So uh, when he had the Seder, the Passover meal, he invited me to come to the meal with his family. And I was delighted to do that. I'd never enjoyed a Seder with a Jewish family before. And uh, Shimon was a good friend. And so I, he, I knew I could ask him questions about everything that was happening. And his little boy totally went to the door and, and looked up and down the street. They looked for Elijah to come, left an empty chair at the table. We ate the bitter herbs. And, and then I saw something on the table that really surprised me. On the table was a leg of lamb. And I said, what in the world is that? Oh, he said, that's the Zora. I said, what's the Zora? And he took me to Deuteronomy chapter five and verse 15. And he says, well, uh, when the Jews came out of Egypt, he said, uh, we celebrate the Passover. We had to uh, kill a lamb and put the blood on the doorpost. And he says, we don't do that anymore, but now we have the leg of lamb on the table because it reminds us that an innocent victim had to die so that we could have freedom. And he quoted this text, remember that you were slaves in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Well, that mighty hand and outstretched arm is the Zora. <clears throat> so I begin to wonder what in the world does that mean? The mighty arm of God. So I found in Isaiah 52 verse 10, it says the Lord has made bare his holy arm. Now the word for made bare is it means stripped naked or exposed. So he's exposed his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. So that holy arm has something to do with the salvation of our God. So that still didn't answer my question. What is it? The Jews be <clears throat> believe that, that God delivered them from Egypt with his powerful holy arm. But then I, I discovered Isaiah 53 talks about the arm being revealed. It begins Isaiah 53 verse one, who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he, sh and then it, it starts the rest of the passage. So it says it's revealed. <clears throat> well, how's it revealed? Well, as I begin to look at this, it dawned on me, that it's revealed in what the Lord has done. And so 10 times it tells us in this chapter that he was taking our place and paying the price of our sins. The first one is found in verse four. He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. The second one is wounded for our transgression and uh, for our, he was wounded for our transgression. The third one, he was bruised for our iniquities. The fourth one, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And number five, by his stripes we are healed. And then it gets down uh, in verse six, it says, or, or seven, it says, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Number seven is in verse eight, for the transgression of my people he was stricken. So it tells us that he's doing this 
for us. He's paying the penalty of our sin. And then in verse 10, you make his soul an offering for sin. And then the ninth one is in the last of verse 11, he shall bear their iniquities. So he's paying the penalty of our sin. And then in verse 10, he has borne the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So it seemed to me as I begin to see this, if it's revealed here and the word revealed is niglata in the Hebrew, and it means put to shame, disgrace, stripped naked, exposed, laid bare. All those things happened to Jesus on the cross. He was stripped naked, he was exposed, he was laid bare. But we know he could have called 10,000 angels. We sing that song, he could have called 10,000 angels. But he, his something held him there. It was his love for you and me. And his strong arm is his love for us that would call him to take our place. He, he went to the cross freely of his own free will and his love held him there, his love for you and me. And then I, was, I discovered something else in this passage that just blew my mind. <clears throat> I was looking at this in the Hebrew and in verse nine it says, he made his grave with the wicked and we know he was crucified between two criminals, but with the rich in his death, and he was buried in a rich man's tomb. But when I was looking at this word death, in the Hebrew it's mavat, but any time in the Hebrew you add I am to a word, you make it plural. And as I looked at this in the original language, it's, it's mavat im, it has I am. It's like a adding S to a word. But I looked at every translation in the Bible and none of them translate it plural. I couldn't find any. And that blew my mind. So I went and talked to the Hebrew scholar and he says, oh, that's simple. When a word in Hebrew that is unique, when the word can't contain the meaning, he said they take a word that's singular and make it plural. And so I, he says, what, where specifically are you talking about? I told him Isaiah 53, 9. Oh, he said, that's simple. He said, first of all, it could be singular, but it's unique because it's, he's dying the second death and nobody in history has ever died that death. So it's a unique death. And secondly, he said it, it could be translated plural because it wasn't his death he's dying. He's dying all of our deaths. He's dying for each one of us. So it's his love that caused him to pay the price. The strong arm of God is his love for humanity. That's what caused him to deliver Israel from Egypt, from slavery. He wants to deliver us from the slavery of sin. The most powerful uh, arm or power in the universe is the love of God. It's what changes people's lives. When they fall in love with the Lord, then they, they want to do the things that please him. You don't do them to earn something. You do it because you fall in love with him and realize how much he loved you. Then I discovered something else in this passage. If you look at verse two, it says, he shall grow up uh, before him as a tender plant. The shell is future. Then you look in verse three, it says, he is despised and rejected. That's present tense. He, that, that's the present tense, the verb is. And then you look in verse four, surely he has borne our iniquity, that's past tense. How can the same event be in the future, in the present, in the past? It's because his sacrifice for our sins takes care of all of our past sins, it takes care of our struggles in the present, and it takes care of any failures we would have in the future. You see, time, uh, his love it goes beyond time. It's past, present, and future. His love is there to, to reach out and touch us to pay the penalty of our sin. And he did this so that we can have eternal life. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for that holy arm of the Lord his love for me, his love for you. I pray that, that you'll accept that love. You'll accept his dying in your place, 
paying the penalty of your sin, that you'll fall deeply in love with him because he loves you with an everlasting love. His love got him to go to the cross to pay the penalty of your sin and mine so that we can be free of the slavery of sin and so that we can have the gift of eternal life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful for Jesus. I'm so thankful for his gift, his love for humankind, his love for me individually. I'm thankful, Lord, for his strong arm, that love that kept him on the cross, willing to take my place, to die for each one of us so we don't have to die that second eternal separation from God, but where we can be reestablished to our heavenly family because he so loved us that we won't, don't need to perish if we accept his gift. Lord, help all of us to fall deeply in love with him because he first loved us. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.